Hi there, it's Peter here again, the guy who hates tomatoes but loves front-end development. In today's video, I will sit down with Simon Vrachliotis from Tailwind CSS and we will break down his current role as a dev advocate or evangelist at Tailwind CSS and we'll talk about the necessary skills to become one or if you are on the hound to hire dev evangelist, you might find this interview useful as well. So if you are curious about this role, keep watching. Hey, Simon, welcome to the show. Welcome to the I Hate Tomorrow's blog. And I wanted to bring Simon on because he is a good friend of mine, online friend. We never met in person, but we've been talking a lot on Twitter and Slack as well. So I wanted to bring Simon on just to talk about content creation, sharing, teaching, learning. And that's where Simon comes in. He's an expert. He is the DevRel at Tailwind CSS. Simon, welcome to the show. Hey, Peter. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. Uh, like you said, it's funny we haven't met in person, but I feel like I know you quite well since over, ye over the years we've been speaking so much. Uh, I can't even remember what was the first thing that brought us to meet each other. I think I was learning Greensock and scrolling animations when I was doing templates for Theme Forest. And whenever yeah. you search these terms, you've done a good job, your stuff comes up right on top and it's all over it. <laughs> yeah, I, th I, think, I think we know each other from, from a while ago when, yes, when you were sort of researching and learning some uh, scrolling animations and I think you bought some of my courses and uh, I think you, you've been sort of great ambassador and great sort of student of mine, but also others as well, because you, you not just learn, but what you learn, you also share as well. So you sort of spread the message a little bit more. And I think that's sort of the spreading of the message about the platform or, or library that you're teaching is, is very, very necessary. So do you, do you agree that that's, that's a skill that someone who should be good at DevRel should have? For sure. Uh, it's interesting because uh, before I knew that this thing was a role and you could actually get paid to do this, I, I think I naturally, like you just said, everything. I, every time I would learn something, I would immediately get excited and share it and do a quick little snippet and put on Twitter like a GIF or a little video or screenshot or anything. And uh, I didn't do it because I was trying to build a brand or something. And that was just me getting excited and naturally loving to teach and learn and eventually i became more conscious hey this is kind of how you can progress in your career i guess because you every time i share something like this you get a bit of following and engagement and yep. uh, further like not so long ago i started realizing it's it's a legit role that companies would hire for like someone who kind of is like a hype man <laughs> someone who gets really excited and can can show how to use the technology and share and teach it to others and I love that I can call it my job nowadays. That's perfect. That's perfect. And uh, I've seen these sort of roles popping up everywhere as well. So I think companies realizing that it's important way to market and to connect the, the brand and the platform and the API, whatever the software is to the actual people using it. And because I think uh, the main reason is because a lot of smart developers, they have these ads blocked you know, installed in the Chrome. And uh, so there's no really way how to target developers because they're smart enough to block any adverts. So to have relationship, have like this softer relationship and connection is, is much, much more effective these days than the hardcore sort of marketing the old way. And But I wanted to revert back and sort of talk about a little bit of your background. How did you actually start it to be uh, in, involved in digital? Are you coming from a design background or, or coding the, the background? What is sort of your story from before you became a DevRel? I'm from a totally different background. I'm actually coming from a primary school teacher background. Long story short, and it's hard to keep it short, but <laughs> I was the head of sports. <laughs> And it's a private school, so we would do some pretty prestigious international sports trips like soccer tournaments and basketball and volleyball. Parents would be like, oh, what's happening? Can, when can we know the results? Can we know the kids are happy? And initially, the, the, the way I would communicate the, the sports results would be a Word document or a PDF. Uh, eventually, I thought there probably, there's probably a better way. Like, is there a way? I, know, I didn't know anything about building websites back then. It's about like 15 years ago. Uh, and I was like... I know there's websites where you can have like a, a score, score stable, standing stables. And when you play the match, you just add the score and it updates the rankings and everyone gets the results straight away. 
I did, like I said, I didn't know much about programming, so I didn't want to code it from scratch. And I found this uh, Drupal 6 CMS, uh, which had uh, a really, really good sports leagues module. And uh, this is for no other reasons than this was doing the, the functionality that I wanted. I, I went out with this and I built a Drupal site and being interested in making it more to my liking and to the, the school's branding and stuff like this, I progressively discovered uh, how to change the CSS with the, there was something called Firebug in Firefox, which let you inspect elements and then change the color of the background from blue to red. And like, wow, I can do this. And then I can change the text color. And, and little by little, I kind of reverse engineered my way from CSS first to then HTML when you realize that you cannot change everything just with CSS, even if you technically can, but you want to do HTML and then PHP templates and I did this website so well that other schools that were in the tournaments were like, hey, uh, we want something like this too. Like, how, Simon, how did you do this? Can you do this for our school? And I ended up being the webmaster of like an association of private schools in Switzerland. Uh, and I did one website for each of them. And then eventually even like one website that had all the schools and all the tournaments and went from full-time teaching to 50% teaching and 50% webmaster. And eventually like went on to to go full time web dev wow so that's 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 pretty much full stack development right in there right you know that um that must be a big job because you know today everyone calls themselves full stack but 10 years ago what we're talking about here was uh, was a little bit people were specializing a little bit more in the either back end or either the front end you've done it all 10 years ago 15 years ago well, I think 10 years ago, you could be a full stack developer or AKA webmaster. <laughs> there wasn't that much to the stack, uh, at least to, to have a product that's out there. Uh, nowadays, like you said, full stack development, there's, there's one area, either it's the UX design or the really nerdy server DevOps stuff, that's gonna be a bit weaker in my opinion. There's no way you can, I mean, some people put it off. Uh, I definitely do not label myself full stack. I think that's that's how, uh, that's, yeah. that's how we learn, and I'm 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 exactly on the same boat. I'm more on the design side of things of the front end. I, I don't like the DevOps stuff too much. If I have to, I suffer through it. But I prefer the taking templates, and building libraries of components that you can reuse on a bigger project, and and sort of scale up from there. And I think I mentioned it in other broadcasts as well that. There's always stuff to Google and stuff to go to over Stack Overflow. There's as long uh, once you grow, you just search for different answers. There's never, you will never know everything. So I think we are all in the same boat, and learning is part of the the front end or the, the development in general. So perfect story. I wanted to sort of after so after you became this teacher webmaster, obviously mm -hmm. you migrated to Australia. And you started working in some agency or how did you sort of, what was your job role in before you became the dev role in Australia specifically? Yeah. So, um, very good question. This, this was the pivotal moment in my career, I'd say. Uh, um, so I was teaching at that private school, uh, in Switzerland and when my wife is Australian for those who don't know, and when we decided to move back to Australia, uh, we had enough savings. We had a little child that was 11 months old, so that was that adds a bit of challenge to the context. But I talked to my wife and I said, hey, I, I would really try to pursue that web development thing uh, now in Australia. I try to find clients or place to work. Uh, she said, you have till Christmas. Like we looked at the, she's a very good financial savvy person. And uh, she was like, you can, uh, we can afford you not having a job for six months. Uh, but by by Christmas, you should be able to say, hey, from now I can make this amount of money to feed the family, etc." And so I was like, sweet, I got this. I'm good. Um, I'm going to find clients. And the first four months until October were really, really bad because I was finding clients, but not enough. And I spent all the time trying to pitch and catch a bus and go meet someone to try to present myself because I didn't really have a portfolio. Then I made a bet, and I think that's a key moment in my career. I made the bet to try, no matter what, uh, to publish a template on Theme Forest, which back then in 2013 was the absolute golden era of Theme Forest. I did a template, got rejected about a million times, uh, but eventually, like mid-October, one day, I've got this email uh, from Envato saying, hey, congratulations, your item is published. I saw that when I woke up in the morning and I had something like 12 sales already, like waking up from bed 
I made like 12 times $12, which is not nothing for sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and my bets paid off as in immediately, pre pretty much a uh, couple of weeks or months after this, I started getting people reaching out to me. <clears throat> the clients would come to me say, hey, we bought these templates. We love it. Uh, we want to tweak it, but we thought maybe you, you do freelance work and no one knows it as well as you do because you built it. And so they would pay me to customize these templates. And uh, it pretty much snowballed. I was about to tell my wife, hey, I'm going to go back to teaching in Australia, which involves doing a degree to have like the Australian certificate. But it kind of snowballed just in time before Christmas that I thought, hey, this thing is taking off. And from there, I've been doing freelancing and then ended up doing, uh, we moved to Sydney and I got a corporate job in Sydney because you, you need that next level of uh, income when you live in Sydney, unfortunately. Uh, and it all snowballed. I kept, I kept doing the thing that I do, which is share what I learned. And I started speaking at meetups speaking at conferences, uh, doing video training, which got me invited to teach on Egghead. And then I moved to work to a pretty prestigious agency in Th Sydney called ThinkMail. And I think, again, all of this happens because I was out there in the community, I was sharing what I learned, and I built this nice uh, little audience and brand of someone that's likable and kind of knows their stuff, but also are pretty good at representing a brand or a product. And the last chapter of this journey is uh, Tailwind Labs. Like you mentioned, about three months ago, I started working. Uh, so uh, we work on Tailwind CSS, but we also have a commercial product called Tailwind UI, which is like lots of UI components that you can assemble together. And uh, you have mentioned a couple of weeks ago these YouTube videos that I'm doing for, for Tailwind Labs. And it's I'm now living the dream of building content for a living. Uh, working from home, whatever hours I want, because the team is in Canada and Europe, and it's fantastic. That's great. That's great. And I think we'll, we're going to get more into the benefits of your role a little bit later. But I wanted to ask you, what made you to switch to from the design development, sort of hands on coding, to being a full time DevRel, which is more about the teaching and of course coding, but you need to, it's more about the content creation marketing. So what made you, what was the final thing to say, okay, let's, let's dump this coding for a client or in an agency and become a DevRel for Tailwind CSS? What made you to make that move? Good question. Um, I mean, some of it happened by design and some also happened by the role, uh, like this last role. At Tailwind Labs, I've been doing some coding and building some Tailwind UI components. But after discussion with Adam Wathen, the one of the creators of Tailwind, uh, with the time zone difference and what I love to do and all the dynamics, it turned out that the, the most efficient way of utilizing me was to have me do community stuff, uh, create content, help people on GitHub. We have a discussion platform and GitHub issues and all that stuff. And uh, it kind of intrinsic it kind of naturally evolved into this role that wasn't necessarily going to be full content creation and it's still not really there's other stuff that i do but i always presented myself as someone who loves sharing stuff and i always joke that my dream role would be <clears throat> would be doing lots of little demos like prototypes really quickly i can do a really good looking prototype in like half an hour and then I hate the step where you have to do cross-browser compatibility and accessibility and all that stuff. It's important, but I'm not as good at it. And it's not where I, I thrive and I get really excited. Uh, and turns out that it's a desirable skill to, to have someone that can just build really cool stuff and share the excitement and then have other people on the team making it super robust and production ready. That's Even great. at ThinkMill, my, my role was a lot of customer-facing talking to the clients because I'm pretty good at doing a presentation and get them on board and excited. And then some more like serious engineers with like years and years and years of experience beyond what I have uh, would go and clean up my little demo and make it like into a, a production ready product. I am capable of doing production ready stuff, but my jam is really the first part where you discover and you prototype and do proof of concept and show it to the world. And then I, I kind of want to move to the next thing like this if I can. Fair enough, fair enough. That's, a, that's a great point. It turns out that you can because it's an actual role. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. And and as I said, there is more roles popping up on Twitter and LinkedIn and everywhere around me. So I know there's definitely more companies are thinking about it. 
And what do you think? So why do companies need a good DevRel? Like obviously you've mentioned it in everything you did so far, but if you would summarize it, why do you think it's important for a company to have someone like you as the face of the brand talking to the developers out there? I think you touched on that before and you said it's really hard to market to developers and they have ad blockers and they have a very high or low threshold for BS and like like if it sounds markety and salesy, they're, they're immediately out of there. Uh, so first of all, it's it's nice to to have content that's publicly free for everyone and that speaks to them and that's how you get the interest of other developers or even companies these days. I think it's it's true very very true in development but even the whole world as marketing is changing a lot more like less and less people watch tv commercials they decide when they watch stuff on netflix or on youtube and if they watch a sports game as soon as the commercial come up they pull up their phone and do their own stuff during the commercials so <laughs> you, you need to actually capture their attention in a way that speaks to them and it's not selling to them and I feel that, like the secret to this, and it's not a secret, it's just to give everything that you know for free and keep sharing it. And then you build this kind of karma points or like street cred. And people, when you have something to sell, they're like, hang on, these guys keep giving me all that stuff and they're so nice and so helpful and I want to buy this product. And I'm sure in your, because you do a lot of courses, you observe that like the more stuff you give for free and the YouTube videos you do, then you've got that that gif of the shut up and take my money when you're about to sell a course because people are like ready to give back to you yeah i think that's that's one of the parts that obviously content creators do it and of course we need to somehow survive so it's not possible to give everything for free and uh, you know obviously in your role as a content creator for a brand i'm sure there is there is always the financial behind it, you know what I mean? So I'm sure you'll have a product that one day you'll, you try to sell and the bigger the audience, and then there is a bigger chance that someone will convert to a paying customer. So I think having 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 sort of a plan, financial plan, is behind all these DevRels as well. All these big companies that have a free product, they have also paid products. So the bigger the platform is, or the, I mean bigger the, bigger the audience is at the bottom level where things are free, there is a bigger chance that they will trust the brand and and like it and like to use it and they will move to the next step whether it's hosting whether it's some premium features or premium courses i think that's a natural part of content creation and uh, you know as i said your role is now full time role of that which is which is quite amazing so i have another question for you which brands do you think apart from tailwind css that they already have a top top guy in charge of DevRel, which other brands do you think have really mastered the dev relationship in terms of uh, speaking to the devs, being out there and sharing stuff? That's a great question. And I think that you will agree with the answer. What The first one I can think of is Netlify. Netlify, uh, well, first of all, they have a great product, right? You can't uh, build a lot of audience if your product is not appealing. Apologize for the dog at the back. That's all right. That's right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Netlify has uh, uh, started doing great content a few years ago. Uh, uh, and now they hired a bunch of people that are like literally content creators and fun content creators like Cassidy. And uh, I think they're doing a great job. Uh, Next.js is doing really good in that term. Uh, Sanity.io. I have never used Sanity, but I love the brand and I love the product and I would love to try it. And you always hear them be like sponsors on shows like Syntax FM and, but also like they, if you're on Twitter and you participate to a conversation, someone will come and be a human, just be a nice person and never trying to sell stuff. And I think that's a good example. I've never used Sanity, but I know what it is and I know I would like to try it one day. Yeah. Um, Perfect example of, these? again, how, how, how the good DevRel just keeps keeps your brand or keeps your product on people's mind and when they decide to hey we need to use a cms or use we need to host content somewhere then if your brand is the first one on top of their mind then they are the first one to try it so i think it just bring uh, it just builds the awareness about the brand or software or api or wh whatever that is whatever the platform is just being being on the top of the list if I decide to change or build something with X, Y, and Z, 
your brand will be at the top. So I think that's another sort of takeaway for maybe if 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 you're watching and your brand is thinking to hire someone as your DevRel, then being, as I said, being on top of the list of people people's mind when it comes to your brand and whatever the brand covers is is very, very important. And I know you are a big basketball player and uh, I, I wanted to ask you, who do you think is the LeBron James of DevRel? Is there someone, and you've already mentioned the brands, but are there specific people that you feel building these brands and not not their own brands, but maybe the brand yeah. for the brands, you know what I mean? Tough question. I like the analogy. Uh, <laughs> one thing about LeBron James uh, is he's been playing forever. Uh, like I think he's been in 16 or 17 season and still like, I mean, he just won the NBA finals MVP yesterday. Um, I The longest lasting DevRel that I know of, and he lives in Australia, is Phil Nash. Filio from Twilio, and uh, I don't want to say he's LeBron James because uh, he's as, all I've seen from him is always at uh, Twilio. Maybe he was uh, being Devil before that, but he, he's the person when I think of this role. Like I met him years and years ago at a conference, Web Directions conference, which run in Australia, and uh, he gave me one of these Twilio T-shirts. And anyone who owns these Twilio T-shirts, they they're so comfortable, like. Most conference t-shirts, you wear them and they're a bit itchy or the shape is weird and then you use it as a pyjama or whatever. <laughs> uh, Twilio, shout out to Twilio for the t-shirts. And uh, I've seen a, a few people like on Twitter, like giving shout outs to these t-shirts. So I think Phil is doing a phenomenal work, phenomenal job. And his his role was like literally going at conferences and having a booth and doing a quick demo. Hey, let's hook up uh, Twilio with whatever front end or back end. And uh the company has been doing a lot of sponsorship, like they, they provide the coffee, for example, at Web Directions and they give the t-shirt. So there's this brand thing. But then Phil carries the whole uh, DevRel vibe around it and everyone knows him and he's always like he's six foot something, like probably six two, six three. He's, he wears his red Twilio t-shirt and he's at every single meetup and conference and live stream and Twitch and he's, he's all over it. So all that would be right. my LeBron. <laughs> That's not nice. that's your LeBron. That's fantastic. And talking about t-shirts and pajamas, where can we expect uh, to to be able to get uh, Tailwind branded pajamas? Mm, I cannot guarantee anything, but there is like I have access to this. There's not much secret about Tailwind Labs. Like we very work in public, which is again how we build the brand and the like the attention. But there's there's a few little projects that we don't talk about and it mentions t-shirts and stuff. Uh, I'll see if I can slide a little pyjama pants uh, <laughs> tailwind in there as a feature request. <laughs> that would be fantastic, yes. And uh, look, I know, I know. as I said, I know your role is is a little bit different than the nine to five that probably people watching now, they either freelancers or they work for a small agency or bigger agency or product. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they sort of, the traditional nine to five work, but I'm sure your day does not look like the average nine to five. So can you give us a little, a little rundown of what your day look like, looks like? Yep. So I have, uh, as you guessed, complete freedom of building my own hours according to what gets me in the zone and productivity. As long as I deliver the work I have to deliver and we have, uh, Every two weeks, we have a one-on-one -on -one catch up with Adam and I try to every day have a, usually not about work, uh, but I try every day to have a chat with the team uh, on the platform we use for chat. And it's kind of nice because these chats happen in my morning and my evening, which is when I don't work and they don't work. So it's mostly casual, like water cooler chat. And I think it's quite important when you completely distributed company. Uh, we're a very small team, only five or six at the moment. And uh, it builds that little bond. I think we had only one single uh, uh, Zoom call. It wasn't Zoom, but like we had a call where we saw each other's faces. And Adam and Steve, the founders, speak to everyone regularly. But uh, for me and Brad and Robin, other team members, that was the first time we, we saw each other, <laughs> which was pretty cool because we talk every day. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, that's I'm going to say this. I have total freedom. And first of all, I was like, this is awesome. I'm going to start super early. So... I get in the zone when the kids sleep and then I can talk to the team because they're still working. And then I'm going to take like 
almost the, the entire end of the morning, afternoon and go surfing and enjoy the beach and life and then work in the evening again. I thought that was the, the perfect plan because uh, it gives me my freedom to do the stuff I like, like surfing, and it gives me more overlap with the rest of the team. The thing I did not factor in is uh, I live in a really small house and when the kids are in the house, the focus ability, <laughs> the availability to <laughs> deep, deep dive and deep thinking uh, in code goes out the window completely. And then I realized I have this uh, really nice setup, but it's in the kitchen dining area. And my window is from 9 a.m. till 3 p.m. during the school hours. My wife is a teacher, so everyone's at school. And I have this window and I'm taking my break during this window. And then when I come back, it's, it's chaos. And I feel like I don't spend time with the family and I'm trying to work and tell them to be quiet. And it's, it does not work. Mm -hmm. And then I spoke to Adam and he was like, man, just, just do, a, if you feel like, do a nine to five without feeling obligated to do, but do whatever you would do if you were running your own thing. And then uh, we'll find a way to communicate asynchronously and catch up regularly and I ended up having a fairly normal working hours. Uh, I bring the kids to school and then I start work and I work till three, four, sometimes five because the kids go do an activity. Mm -hmm. And then when everyone goes to bed, if I have to, I do a couple more hours. But <clears throat> again, I, I don't want to sound too loose, but I'm pretty sure if I want to do four hours one day and 10 hours the next day and like try to just compact work in a way that works for what I have to do, it's, there's no problem. Mm -hmm. We don't have stand-ups or meeting or catch-ups. We, we have a very well-organized uh, work cycles and planning. So we're actually quite efficient like that. But then it's really up to me. And some people love it and some people hate it because they're like, oh, I'm going to slack off and watch YouTube and no one is here to tell me, hey, go back to work. Uh, I yeah. love it. I personally am very accountable and good with communication, so it fits me really well. But I'm sure you've spoken to people uh, when uh, COVID hit in March and people started working from home. I'm sure you would have heard people saying, I can't focus. The fridge is here. The TV is there. And exactly. like, I, it's, it's uh, not for everyone. some people cannot thrive like this. And I actually, even before coronavirus was a thing, I was begging companies to let me work from home because I know I'm way more productive like this. And, and I think that's where it's shifting these days because obviously COVID <clears throat> makes everyone work from home. But I think now a lot of companies realize that they don't need to spend money on offices in the city. And, and obviously that's expensive. They can rather maybe spread the company more international and hire in different time zones. I think that's a big, big benefit for a company to have a few people in different time zones and then when the majority of the team sleeps, still things are moving when, when you hire someone on the other side of the world. So in yep. in Australia, obviously, we isolated. We sort of at the, at the end of the world when, you know, when it comes to the tech tech world. And uh, But that's a benefit of being part of a company that is maybe based on you in the US or in Europe. You can still help create content or do things overnight for them. But for you, it's a daylight. So... I think it's a big benefit for the companies as well to spread more international, different time zones. So when I was interviewing or like discussing uh, with Adam about me joining Tailwind Labs, uh, he often referred to the, his worry about the time zone and thinking it could work, but really wondering what happens if uh, he thinks of something and wants to pick me and is oh, it's 2 a.m., I've got to wait for tomorrow. And there, there was a lot of... Uh, not tension, but there was a lot of uh, question mark. Let's have an honest conversation. How are we going to handle this? And my pitch was like, I can try to focus on more async stuff, like help the community on different time zones and things like this. But as a joke, I said to him, there will be one day where it'll be 5, 6 p.m. your time and the kids uh, need you. And you will think of a thing and you'll say, oh, my God, Simon just starts in one hour. I can make a little document for him. Hey, could you please do this last minute stuff? And then I can do it. And I said to him, like, one day you, you'll have this and you'll tell me and you'll go to sleep. And the next day it'll be here. And about uh, a week ago, uh, we launched that new thing called the Tailwind Playground, uh, which I'd love to talk to you about. And uh Literally, like I, I was working at something else. I knew this was a project, but I had not looked at it at all. And I think it was a Thursday morning for me. Like I wake up and I make breakfast with the kids and I pull up my phone 
and I see this uh, DM from Adam say, hey, uh, up to you, your call since it's a short notice, but I just thought if you wanted to make one of your YouTube videos to present that thing, that would be amazing. Uh, I'm going to launch it when I wake up tomorrow, so no pressure, like feel free to tell me too late. And I was like, this is the moment I was talking about. And he went to bed and I made a really, really cool video and I put it on YouTube, unlisted. And he woke up in the morning and watched it and turned it uh, public and launched the thing with the video. And it would never have happened if everyone was in North America time zone. So yeah. that's, that's one of the benefits that the more you lean on it, you realize you can have this round the clock team working and uh, it's got lots of advantages as well. Yeah, that's perfect. That's a perfect example. And, and, you know, as I said, you work overnight. For them, it's a daylight and uh, they wake up in the morning and part of the project is is completed. And just surprises me that you spoke about how well organized you are and then you get this last minute task. So <laughs> we need you need to talk about the project planning and cycle planning a little bit. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, no, Adam is uh, a phenomenal uh, thinker and manager like the the level of thinking and planning and i don't know if you consume his content but he's he's been uh really thinking deep about how to run a team because it's quite new to him uh and uh, talking to the people the founders of Basecamp, how they they plan this thing on six week cycles and he's really really good at uh getting a team to be motivated and do stuff without being the nagging like looking over the shoulder uh pressure uh, then it doesn't stop the fact that sometimes you have an idea and you're like, oh, that would be cool, like little cherry on top. And uh, I, I actually appreciate that he pinged me for that because some bosses could have been like, oh, no, I don't want, I don't want to sound like, um, like just not respecting his program or time. And I, I thrive again for this moment. Like it, for me, it looks good too. I'm the one who's got my voice on the video and it brings my little like audience thing. And I love doing this. I'm good at it. And I know it kind of doesn't save the day because the launch was already amazing, but it just adds this little layer of uh, like shine on top. And uh, yep. it just win wins all around. So it's nice. Nice, nice, nice. Really good. And we can, we can, of course, include links in the description for people that want to follow Adam if they're building a remote team or team in different time zones then definitely yes as you mentioned if adam's building it and learning and sharing content around it definitely we can leave it in the comments we'll of course leave the comments or leave the link to the playground that we will talk in another broadcast sometimes in the future i didn't want to focus this uh, talk and this chat on tailwind css because that's completely different topic. I wanted to sort of stay focused on the dev relationship and I think it, it went really well. We talked more than, than I expected, to be honest. But I think it just shows that we have quite quite a lot of in common when it comes to teaching, learning, sharing, content creation. And uh, also we share the same time zone, which is pretty unique. Yes, you're <laughs> one of the rare people I can uh, ping during the day at 2 p.m. Uh, most of my collaboration with Tailwind or anyone uh, who's not in Australia is really early or just before bed. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thanks a lot, Simon. As I said, I'll have another videos coming up on Tailwind CSS. I'm starting with it. So Simon's going to help me along the way. And uh, thanks for chipping in your knowledge and sharing your story when it comes to how to become a dev relationship or DevRel, I still, I still, the DevRel still doesn't go easy, nice out of my mouth. I don't know what it is, the name. Is there, is there another way for it, a DevRel? Or? I literally Googled how, what, how to name yourself when you do like content stuff, but also development. And I don't know, I, there's people that call them advocates and evangelists. And I, I think we know we're talking right. about the same thing, but just DevRel yes. doesn't go nice. And also, is DevRel specific for developers or do design communities have the same thing? I'm sure they have the same thing. If you have a product that yes. is related more to the design side of things, it's not Des DevRel, right? It's it's still there's, called there's DevRel. Rail, design rail. <laughs> there's definitely some... Uh, there's potential for more roles of these, actually, now you said this. Pablo Stanley is the, the one person that I think of. Uh, I'm not even sure where he works these days, but he's always been doing uh, amazing content for designers. Uh, another another link that we'll just dump into yeah. the description. So if you are into the DevRel, DevRel role, if you would like to maybe change the path of your career or if you're working in a company and you feel like the 
take on from the design or developer community is not as big that as you would like to then hiring someone like Simon and that's going to be very hard to convince him to jump from Tailwind CSS to somewhere else. It's impossible, as, as, <laughs> as he says. But uh, yeah, thanks, Simon, for coming on. Pleasure to talk to you. And uh, I'll catch you in uh, some other broadcasts in the future. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. That was great. Great chat with Simon. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. If you followed all the way here, then you definitely enjoyed it. So make sure you hit the like button, you subscribe to the channel for more videos like this and let me know in the comments what other topics you would like to you would like me to cover in the next videos until then happy coding